Okay, the purpose of this video is to introduce the Fourier series, uh, describe a little bit about how it works, and present the uh, formulas that you use to do computations. Um, there will be another video that actually shows an example of these computations. So the uh, order of uh, topics that I'd like to do today, we'll start off looking at the complex exponential Fourier series formulas. And then we'll look at some of these, the properties of the complex exponential Fourier series coefficients. And then we'll look at trigonometric Fourier series formulas. And uh, if this, if the first two items get long, then we may actually end up doing the last item as a separate video. So Fourier series apply when you have a periodic function. So I've drawn a periodic function x of t here. It has a fundamental period of t sub 0 given by this, and the angular frequency associated with this is omega 0, or radian frequency, uh, 2 pi over t 0. We'll need that in the formulas. Okay, again, uh, Fourier series apply to periodic functions. If you have a function that's not periodic and you want to do Fourier analysis, you would use a Fourier transform, which will show up in another video. So the idea is I can go one of two directions. If I'm given the function x of t, I can compute these complex exponential Fourier series coefficients, which we represent as c sub minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, and so on. Basically, the general one will represent as c sub k, and k will go from minus infinity to infinity and be an integer. Okay. So the idea is that I can take x of t and I can express it as a sum of sinusoids with these complex uh, Fourier series coefficients in front of them. Well, actually, it's uh, a sum of complex exponentials. The formula by which I would do this looks like this. x of t is equal to the summation from k going from minus infinity to infinity of c sub k e to the j k omega 0 t. So what I have are these complex exponentials, which you'll hopefully remember this is uh, a cosine plus a j sine term times the Fourier series coefficients, and this gives me x of t. So this is quite useful to be able to represent this x of t in this form. Uh, it turns out that there's a lot of things you can do, filtering, um, uh, other types of uh, signal processing, like speech compression and so on, that this, looks, this works very well for. Uh, the typical problem you see is given a particular x of t, I want to compute the c sub k's. Although it's possible that you could be given some c sub k's and try to figure out what x of t is. It just doesn't, we don't do that very often. The c sub k's are computed using the fact that these complex exponentials are orthogonal to each other for different values of k. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail what that means. But basically, you use that orthogonality to get the following formulas for the c sub k. So c0 is 1 over t0. The integral over one period of the function. So basically, I could start at 0 and go out to t0. So that would be one valid integral. Or I could start at perhaps minus t0 over 2 and go out to t0 over 2. I need to integrate over one period of the function, but where I start and where I stop uh, doesn't change the answer. It may turn out to make the integrals that you have to work easier or harder. So we have that integral x of t dt. So this gives us c0, the coefficient for k is equal to 0. And c0 is sort of a special case in the sense that it is the average value of the signal over one period. Uh, 
when you get further into Fourier analysis, you'll oftentimes see C0 as the DC component of your signal. The um, other C sub k's are given by the following formula. It looks a lot like this first formula up until the point where we're at here. And we add a complex exponential into the integral. Okay, so this is for the case where k is equal to 0. This is for the case where k is not equal to 0. And once we've computed the c sub k's, then if we want to, we can reconstruct x of k this way. Um, it turns out that the c sub k's are generally complex in the sense that they have a real and an imaginary part. So let me tidy up a bit here and we'll talk just a little bit about what this means. So since c sub k is complex, I can talk about it having a real part and an imaginary part, which I'll call alpha and beta. Oops, and I'll make a mess here. Uh, we'll try to tidy that up just a bit. So alpha k is the real part of c sub k, and beta k is the imaginary part. So if I graph this on a complex plane, I might have the point here where this is alpha k plus j beta k. I can also represent this in terms of a magnitude, which we typically call, or just put vertical bars uh, by c sub k, and an angle, which we typically represent by this angle sign. So if I draw this, then the magnitude is the length of the segment between uh, c sub k and the origin. And the angle of c sub k is the angle between typically the real axis and uh, this line that I've drawn between c sub k and the origin. Sometimes you'll see these called rectangular. And this uh, is polar or magnitude phase. And there are different advantages to each of these ways of representing the C sub k's. Okay, some interesting things happen. There's uh, some sort of magical bits about the, uh, uh, the C sub k's. It turns out that if x of t is a real function, and that means that it's only real valued, it has no complex components. And you may ask yourself, why on earth would, earth would you ever have anything other than a real valued function? It turns out in communication systems, quite often you create complex valued functions for their spectral properties. But if x of t is real, then c of minus k is c of k conjugate. In other words, um, c of minus k is the same as c of k, or c sub k, except that the sign of the imaginary part is opposite. It also turns out that if x of t is even, then c sub k is real. So if x of t is an even function, then uh, the, uh, the Fourier series coefficient will have no imaginary part. If x of t is odd, then c sub k will be imaginary. Okay, so there you have it. Um, I think, actually, let's go back to our outline of where we're headed. Uh, we've talked about the complex 
Fourier series or complex exponential Fourier series formulas. We just finished talking about properties of the complex exponential Fourier series coefficient. So rather than uh, talk about trigonometric Fourier series formulas in this video, I'll stop at this point and then we'll have another short video about trigonometric Fourier series. Um, the last thing I'd like to do is introduce you to this URL which has an applet that allows you to explore Fourier series of different functions and it has all sorts of interesting uh, bells and whistles. You can listen to the signals as you're uh, uh, computing Fourier series. You can uh, uh, look at reconstructions of signals and so on. So I would uh, recommend this to you. It uh, gives you a nice visual interactive way to figure out how this stuff works. So we'll end this video here and do a trigonometric Fourier series video in just a minute.